Katie, I'm so excited to have you here today. You have brought to life a platform that is impacting so many families around the world and also helping providers. And that's really where I want to start with your journey is, can you bring us up to speed? You were in and out of so many different units, so many different experiences, and you saw a need to connect families and providers with a platform to support the medical world of children and child life as a whole. How did this form in your head? As an app creator myself, people ask me this all the time and they're like, how did that come together in your head? And I think it's really hard to explain, but I'd love to see you take a, take yes. a go at it oh my gosh. and how it came together for you. Kelsey, I'm so excited to be talking with somebody who gets it and knows that there is like no path and there's no template online that can show you how to build something like this. So yeah, I think my origin story is I have been a child life specialist for 14 years. And for those of you who don't know what that is, that is totally fine. We have to explain our job all the time. Actually, as child life specialists, we have this running joke that the first time you go out on a date with someone, you just tell them you're a nurse. Like it's just easier and you don't have to get into it. Um, but as a child life specialist, we are basically experts in child development, psychosocial care, and family systems. And predominantly, we work in children's hospitals and help kids and families process all that comes along with that. So that may be a new diagnosis. It may be pain. It may be procedures. It may be separation. Um, all of these different um, really challenging events that happen for families in the hospital and through different healthcare and different difficult experiences and how can we support families through it. So Often I could be literally at in a trauma room as a child comes in at the head of the bed with the care team, helping the child um, process what's happening to them. I could be doing bingo in the playroom the next hour. And then after that, I could be receiving a donation and then I'd wrap my day up with chart notes. So every day looks different, which is what I love about child life. But um, just in kind of what I explained to you, we have so many different responsibilities. And because of that, we often don't get to see, uh, we don't see every family that comes into the hospital. So there's a big gap in getting families access to our resources. And that's really where kind of my entrepreneur and founder brain started to like take shape and think about, well, how could we start filling that gap? And the obvious answer was technology, which I think is probably what you felt too. Yeah. Well, I think parents, especially in this situation and what we've seen with Mama Has Goals, they need something that they can access at any time, right? They need exactly. to be able to dive into it when they need it and not try to go through a bunch of calls. Or for our community, what we noticed is they were going through research and on Pinterest and on Google, and they were getting more overwhelmed. And I can imagine that's the same with your community. They're in a place where they need something clean and easy and streamlined and being able to support them in a way that's not going to create more overwhelm and more stress. And you've done such a beautiful job of that. And what you've added that makes it even more accessible for these families is partnering with the organizations that they're working with. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about, did it start that way or has it evolved into partnering with these organizations? How did it come to be? Yeah, it's so true. Cause you're so right. It's, it's the vetted resource that you don't like, we always joke and you'll know this, right? Like having little kids, especially when they're little, like you find the end of the internet, right? Like you literally have <laughs> come through every single page that's on there. And likewise, when your child is going through something difficult or your family is, you often go to the internet to try to find these resources. And sometimes you can find amazing things and you have that aha moment, but what's better is having like that trusted verified source of things that are already curated for you in this specific circumstance. Um, and so really that's, you know, families tell us that it's almost nice to have the information beforehand. So that way, when you actually get to the event that's difficult, you're already prepared. You already have a resource on demand in your pocket. Um, and so that's why, you know, one of the questions you asked me at the beginning before we started um, this interview was, is who is Child Life on Call for? And really it is for every parent because we want every parent to feel like they're a confident advocate for their child during healthcare experiences. We so often as parents will advocate like, I, you know, I don't think this teacher is right for my son, mm -hmm. or I don't like my daughter's coach, or why is she always standing in the back line of cheer practice? But when it comes to doctors or medical things, we tend to just keep quiet. And as a child life specialist, I've seen firsthand that when parents 
know how to advocate, they know how to speak to the individualized needs of their child, the whole care team just hops on board and things go so much smoother. Um, an yeah. example I like to give a lot is like um, a kiddo who has sensory needs and they don't like it when there are like loud beeping noises. So what happens in hospitals? loud beeping noises. But if we know that ahead of time, then if there's going to be a beep, we can tell the child to put their earphones on. That will dramatically change that family's experience and that child's experiences. So, sorry, I got a little off topic. I want to get back to your question. No, I always okay. knew. That's, that's a yeah. good example though. And I love that you bring that up is because I think sometimes when we think about advocating for our kids and what they need, especially in a medical environment, it's, we don't think of something maybe as small as putting headphones on. And oh, yeah like you're saying, being the provider on the other end, we want us to both win, right? We want us to both have that situation. So if we can say, hey, this is a need that my child has or a preference even, then the team can show up and do their job in such a better way. And they can make the experience better because no one wants their kid to be sick. No one wants their kid to be in the hospital. And so if we can make the experience better when we have to be in those situations, then it allows everyone to just be able to be a team and focus on what matters. And that's making the little one better, right? Yeah, exactly. They don't know if you don't tell them. You're exactly right. And sometimes it's illness and hospitalization. And like for my daughter, she just had a burn um, about three months ago um, on her face. And right, so that's something we weren't anticipating. Um, But I felt like I knew the tools to advocate for her and for my needs. Mm -hmm. And that I knew because of her age, we needed to stay close together and that I was going to sit on the bed with her. So these small little things that can really make it a more collaborative environment. Like we don't want parents sitting on the sidelines in healthcare experiences. We want parents in it with their kids because both will succeed so much better. Yeah. Okay. So the question, and now I have a spinoff to that question, but (laughs) we'll go back to the original question. When you started, was the mission and the vision to always start with the organizations and the hospitals and the providers, and then have that be the primary way that parents could access the app? Because right now they can access it both ways, right? If they're in a situation, the provider may be able to provide this resource to them, or everyone that's listening can head to the app store and download Child Life on Call and have it before they even maybe need it. So which one came first and what was kind of the thought process behind it? Yeah, great question. Um, First, the process was to expand what child life specialists do and where they work. So primarily that's hospitals. So what it Mm -hmm. looked like at the beginning was kind of this business to business Uh, Child Life on Call works with the hospital so that they can ensure that every family who walks through that door gets equitable services to psychosocial care. Um, That was important, equitable services. In addition to the fact that there are so many out-of-pocket costs when it comes to health care, and psychosocial care shouldn't be excluded from that. So what I want is for families to have access for free for these things. Now, um, working with hospitals is a whole other podcast. It is exhausting. And (laughs) I've worked for them and been in so many rooms and spoken to so many hospitals. And the process is just long. Um, Because of that, we've developed this other B2C concept, which looks like Child Life on Call, providing this app for families who want to have it, even if they're not connected to that organization, because there's still so much goodness and resources. You know, you mentioned sensory preferences. So there's a sensory preferences form to fill out before you go to the doctor's office um, and asks you specific questions about your child's sensory preferences so you can send it to them. For every procedure that comes up, we have... um, Uh, So for example, if the procedure is just something like a blood draw, if your child has to go in for a blood draw, we walk you through what is a blood draw? Why does your child need the blood draw? What is the sequence of events? Like what will you actually experience from the moment you walk into that uh, setting? And then most importantly, how do you advocate for your child who needs your blood, that blood draw? And so we have a library of about a hundred plus procedures, um, all curated by child life specialist content to make families feel like they're not, they're no longer walking into the unknown. They're walking in empowered and informed and ready to partner. Yeah. So good. Now, how long has the app been available for access to the, to the general public? Okay. I, I think about three months. Wow. So <laughs> yeah. New. So yeah, it's so, it's so brand new and 
it's, it's an important life cycle for our resources because we wanted it to work in the hospital setting before we brought it to consumers. We wanted yeah. to hear this is what families want. This is, you know, this journal symptom checker, this how to advocate, this questions to ask the doctor, you know, what, how can I participate in rounds that these things that were on the app actually did make a difference. And so um, learning all of those things, getting so much insight, um, as you know, like listening to the community, what are you using? What are you not using? That really helped yeah. us form this product that could then serve the general public. Yeah. And it's so beautiful and so streamlined. I absolutely Thank love you. it. So I want to give you two examples that have happened to me and a friend with our kids. You brought up blood draws and I want to know if this app would support us in it. So my son hit his head um, and was playing with a family member. They like collided and he had a big bump that was expanding rapidly, right? For a non-medical Terrifying. person as myself, I'm like, I don't know. Is he okay? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It could just be a bump on his head, but also how do we know there's not something going on on the inside and what's happening? Right. And in this moment, he was like inconsolable, right? So that's always like right. another issue is you're like, okay, are you okay? And yeah. so in that situation, I have a, luckily a friend that works in the emergency room and I'm, she's always my, you know, child life on call. Thank God for existed. those friends. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm texting her pictures. I'm like, where should we go to the emergency room? What should happen now? He ends up being fine. But when we go into the emergency room, you know, we don't really know what to say, like how to answer the questions. Our emergency room where we live could be a little bit better. And so there's not a lot of urgency yeah. when you come in. Things that you navigate as a parent are different than the than what they have to do to operate as a business. Right. And to be right. able to be on the other side. So what are some ways that this app could have helped us in that situation? What, is there any way that we could have used it to like look up any symptoms or know how to advocate for ourselves when we walked in or anything like that? Is there anything that we would have been able to be like, okay, here's, here's what this yes. says. Totally. And I, gosh, I feel for you. That's such a scary experience of the unknown. And like for you, it's an emergency. And then you walk in and you're like, why is everybody so chill? Um, so here are some of the ways that, um, the app could have been of service to you. Um, one is that there's pictures of like medical environments and medical rooms. So before walking in, you could have shown your picture son, your shown your son pictures of what it was going to look like. And the reason that's important is because walking into an unknown environment as a child can be incredibly scary. You inherently believe that everything there, because you're in a doctor's office, can and will hurt you, right? So like, yeah. what does that do? What does that do? And perhaps it's just the blood pressure cuff, right? Or maybe it's just the otoscope, but it looks like it could be a poke and is that gonna touch me? So when you show your child pictures of something before you walk in, you immediately um, kind of say, this is what the chair looks like. This is what the room looks like. This is who we're gonna meet. They might be wearing hats and masks. Um, you might get a bracelet with your name on it. Um, so just some of these things so that as you go through and you're like anticipating what's coming next, you kind of take a deep breath and we're like, okay, it's cool. We knew it was gonna be like that. We knew what it was gonna look like. The second thing with um, a head injury, um, the doctor may have said something to you like, okay, we're going to do a workup just to make sure everything's fine. And you're like, that sounds great, but what's a workup? <laughs> so you can go to the app, look at what a workup is, what all it includes, and then it would either show you pictures if that included a CT scan, right? So what does a CAT scan look like if that's what they ordered? What does a blood, blood draw look like? How do I prepare my son for that blood draw? How can I hold my son in a position that he's not being held? held down like by a blanket mm -hmm. or by the care team. So, um, so those are all things that could have helped impact your journey if that's what it what ended up being. That is so good. Now I said, I had a friend that had also been in a situation that came to mind. Um, they noticed some things going on with their child and they told the pediatrician, pediatrician said, let's go get some blood work. Blood work yeah. came back with a couple of things. They had to go get another blood draw, things like that, right? So in that situation, I'm curious, this is like the scariness of what could this mean, right? Mm -hmm. And with the internet and with the app, there's yeah. a excess of information, which is so good when presented correctly and done well, like you have. But when someone's in that stage of like, what could this mean? What could this be? How can the app help guide that in a positive way? 
Yeah, I think, gosh, and it's such a scary time. Um, there's two things I'm thinking of. One is that we have the Child Life On Call podcast on there. And the reason we have the podcast on there is it's a over 200 interviews of experiences um, that parents share about their child's healthcare journey, but what it was like for them. So um, in those moments, you feel very isolated. Like, has anyone ever gone through this before? What if something comes back and we don't know what it means? And just mm -hmm. hearing another person go through it is incredibly beneficial. So like when you give birth, it's really nice to listen to other birth stories. Like what was their C-section like? What did it seem like th for them? Um, yeah. Because you're able to hear how other people processed it. And then the second thing is I think the app gives you a lot of things and points out a lot of things that you can control when you're in a situation where you can't control much. So mm -hmm. one is there's a coping plan on there. So a coping plan is where you work with your child and you identify things that coming up for the blood draw, what does your child want to do? Do they want to watch Bluey? Do they want to hold your hand? Do they want to take um, a squeezy ball with them? Uh, what do they want to do when the blood draw is over? And you create this plan so that before you walk into the blood draw, you know exactly what your choices and what your preferences are. And sure, that might not be like the, all the unknown answers to what the blood um, results are actually showing, but it is something that you can control and that's incredibly powerful. Um, a third thing that's coming to mind is we have over a hundred different resources of activities and book lists to do with your child. So books about when things are happening in the unknown, books about blood draws. Um, here's an activity to focus on building positive coping strategies. So all of these things are available to you when you're in that waiting period of not knowing what is going to happen next or what do these results mean. That is so helpful. So good. Now for littler children, there's pros and cons in the sense of they don't fully understand what's going on and it's up to you to kind of create and drive the narrative, right? And that can be good because we can help guide the thoughts and the emotions. Yeah. And it can also be difficult because they don't understand. When we get into older children, they start to create their own narrative. They'll have their own fears, their own concerns. They're going to have their own questions. What are some of the ways that a child could use the app? Or is it really meant for parents to use and the providers? Or is there an age group that you would say, yeah, they could get in and look at their own resources like this age and above? Yeah, great question. So uh, the, the app is primarily developed for parents because we know in order for the child to be able to look at the app and actually get there, we have to have the parent involved first. But when you log in as a parent, there actually is a child section of the app. So in that child section of the app, there's different body parts that the child can like color on and play with. There's some different puzzles. Um, one of the things that like drawing on body parts does, it may seem really simple, but you're actually desensitizing your child to pictures that may otherwise look like a little bit scary, right? Or I don't know what a heart is. Like it's not a shape like this. It actually looks like a heart. So what you're doing is you're actually getting your child prepared to talk about medical things just by interacting with them in a non-threatening way. Um, we've also partnered with a licensed music therapist who has licensed his beautiful ballads and music. I think it's a great kind of calming resource for the app. So while it is primarily built for parents because we want you to be collaborative with the care team, there are resources for kids on there as well. Gosh, so cool. So many good things. <laughs> now I want to talk a little more about your journey building this because taking on an initiative of any sort, whether it's eight loads of laundry or building an app alongside <laughs> so motherhood. One has, load of laundry. Let's, let's be honest. Yeah. Laundry. <laughs> yes. Yes. All of the above. It, it's hard, right? You have to navigate mm -hmm. all the different things. And what I find so admirable about your journey is this isn't even necessarily something that you needed for your family. It was something that you saw as a need professionally, and you wanted to help provide a solution to families and to providers. And so for one, just like, thank you and kudos. Mm -hmm. We need more people like you in the world that are creating good things thank for you. other people. But what has that truly looked like? Like what, how many years have you been on this journey of getting this to life? And what is the behind the scenes with, you know, right now you have a five and eight year old. Those are like pivotal times. You're navigating the seasons. What's been the like dirty behind the scenes journey? Oh man, it's dirty. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> thank you for, for saying that. I feel selfish for 
you know, building the app was also, it's for families, but it was also for myself and my job. I left work every day feeling like I could have done more. I didn't see every family. I was one child life specialist to 80 babies in the NICU. There was just wow. no way I would be able to provide support to every family. But if I, if they had access to the app, then they would have access to resources. And so really that it was built for that. And also for, um, families who are entering these unknowns or more in, um, maybe rural or areas that don't have access to child life services. So that's really what we built. Um, child life on call started as a podcast back in 2017. Um, I really found that in the hospital, parents were lacking connection to other parents who were going through similar situations. So for example, I had a, a mom, she had a three week old with meningitis and I went in to check on her and just chat with her. And she looked at me and she said, please just tell me someone else has gone through this before. And I said, yes, there are other parents who've gone through this before, but I couldn't say like, let's go talk to the mom next door or let's go over here. But I could say, well, look, you can listen to this podcast. Like this is a mom who has gone through this before. And podcasts are such a beautiful passive way of being able to feel connected without having to give too much of yourself, right? When you're about to give birth like you are, or your child is sick, or your child is hospitalized, or your family's going through a divorce, you don't actually want to go to coffee talk, but you could listen to a podcast. Mm -hmm. um, and so really the um, Child Life on Call began as that podcast. And then we just got really curious about how using technology could really support families. And we started building in 2020. Um, we got together a group of multidisciplinary people from um, the pediatric field, so physicians, um, healthcare managers, um, child life specialists, directors, nurse educators, managed care people, and just said, if we were to build this resource, what would it look like? Um, so my dad became my co-founder, um, and we did a raise at the beginning, and it, yeah, for all V founders out there, you know what that looks like. We did a friends and family round of funding. So we basically created a slide deck, had this idea, and we pitched it to as many people in our network as possible. And we raised enough money to be able to start building what the app Child Life on Call would look like. And from then that ended up being about a two year process until we launched at our first children's hospital in Northern Virginia. Um, and that was quarter one of 2022. And so since then, uh, we're now um, April 2024, just over two years out from that first pilot, and we're in seven different hospitals now. So um, we're growing and um, here talking to you, expanding to families outside of the hospital too, so that they can have access to these resources. But the dirty is that it's hard. The dirty is that there are many late nights. Their dirty is that I have to set boundaries for myself and for my family. Um, I love working from home. I think it is like the bee's knees when you have kids who are school age so that you can be there for parent things and be done at three o'clock if you have to or set up a doctor's appointment. But that also really blurs the lines of when do I stop working? And every yeah. time I walk by this room, I think work, work, work. So um, I think there's good and bad, but for right now, it's, it's a beautiful way for me to be able to live my life. So cool. Now, what would you say has been the biggest positive surprise through the journey? I think it has been the relationships I've developed with child life specialists and parents who are hungry for this information. Like when I get the DMs on Instagram that tell me, because I watched this the next day at my child's cardiac appointment, we implemented a comfort position. So my wow. child was no longer held down for his echo. Like that just amazes me. Um, it gives me goosebumps to think about. And I also think just knowing that I was working with somebody at the very beginning of our journey and he was like, Katie, you're like a health tech entrepreneur. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> no, I'm not. And then I started saying, okay, I'm a health tech entrepreneur. And I got open to this whole world of health tech entrepreneurship and yeah. amazing women and female founders who are out there trying to solve problems that actually affect the well-being of kids and families. And it's, it's my favorite group to go to whenever I need something or I need a pick me up because there are many of us going through it just like you. Yeah, that is such a good perspective. I remember the first time someone told me, they're like, you're a tech founder. I was like, no, I'm not. And they're like, yeah. what do you mean? You built <laughs> no, an no, app. No, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, girl, it is you funny. built an you app. 
Yeah. You don't, just, you don't think of it that way. Um, when you're in it, but if that's not yeah. your background now, you're like I'm you, just for solving a problem, like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what do you mean? I have a mom community. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now you have a medical background more than overall. That's the overarching, I, I guess you would say category. And now there are so many people in the world that have something on their heart, but they're like, I don't have a business degree. I don't have a tech background. I don't have these, you know, unsolicited needs that we think that we have to have to jump into our dream. How did you overcome some of that to take the very first step to even share your idea? Because there are so many people out there that are so scared to even say this thing that they've been thinking about for years. And I think, you know, you're a perfect example of it's bigger than you, right? Like you're Mm -hmm. impacting so many families and so many people. And can you imagine if you hadn't acted on that? Like even just the example you just gave of the DM of someone saying like, Hey, I implemented this position and it gave my kids comfort. Like that could have totally made a complete impact to that journey. And it wouldn't have happened without you. And Mm -hmm. so often we get caught up in the sense of like, well, I don't know how to do that. Or I'm not sure what's, what the next step would be. And it's like, but the impact that you could make if you just did move forward is huge. So what would you tell someone that Mm. is taking action? Yeah. I think it's all about like perspective too, and being on this side and still feeling like I'm growing and learning every day. But I think what's really helpful is just like staying curious and really staying true to like what you believe and what you want to do. So when you're curious about something, you're not so much like being like, okay, this is going to be my job. You're just staying curious inside of it. So yeah. like when I started a podcast, I, I don't know if you felt the same way. I'm like, well, let me just read a few blogs on starting a podcast. Okay. Let me just start listening to a few podcast on starting a podcast. Let me just see what it would be like to sign up for Libsyn. You know, so it's like, I wasn't saying I'm absolutely starting this podcast. I just stayed on the path to stay curious about like what was next and what was coming next. Um, And then once you get to that position, you're like, oh gosh, I'm here. Then you have to really start (laughs) thinking about kind of those long-term goals. And, um, but I think like that perspective of always just staying learning and you're not just because you say you want to do something or you set one path forward doesn't mean it's the ultimate path, the only one you can go on. You can pivot. It happens all the time in business. You can change your name. You can change your audience. You can have more than one audience. Um, I know everybody says you have to have this niche audience, but for me, I've always felt like it's a beautiful blend of parents and healthcare professionals who want to support kids. So I don't talk to one audience. I don't follow by those rules. Um, So I think you'll just stay true to what your desire, your path is, because no one else has the idea that you do in the way that you have it. And just staying true to that is going to keep you on task. So good. Now, you mentioned that you really love this group that you found of health tech entrepreneurs now that you've claimed that identity and title. What are some other ways that you've supported yourself as a mom, as a business owner, as just a woman and a person throughout this journey to be able to sustain the hard days and the growth? I don't know about you, but I think that entrepreneurship and stepping into your calling or your goal, whatever that is, it's a fast crash course on like, who am I? What am I doing? And who do I need to become? And you have to grow to be able to do that. So how have you supported that personal growth to be the woman behind this amazing movement? Mm. Thank you. I love your question so much. Um, I I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't speak about my husband, who's an amazing partner. Um, He is a nurse anesthetist or a CRNA, and we met actually working together in the hospital. And um, before we went out on our first date, I asked him, I said, like, what do you think I do? Because it's always interesting. Some people are like, oh, you're the girl who blows bubbles or you walk around (laughs) with the iPad everywhere, you know, like what, like, what do I actually do? And he said, all I know is you make my job so much easier. And I think it helped so much to work with someone who understood how important child life specialists are and how important our work is. You know, he would be putting the kids to sleep for neurosurgery and I would be there supporting the child as they breathed in the mask to fall asleep. So I think because he got what I did and just because he's an amazing guy, he's been an incredible partner and has like really done almost all of the laundry and helps with dinners and is like (laughs) full on 50, 50, if not more so. Um, But as far as myself goes, I think 
kind of what we've said about just being a lifelong learner and staying curious. Like I listen to podcasts, I listen to books, I um, pri try to prioritize my my fitness. And I'd like to say that's all about bettering myself, but I'm also like an 80s kid who's been taught you have to exercise for every calorie you eat, right? So it's like, <laughs> there's a little bit of that in there. Um, and I think, gosh, it's it's good to have these conversations just to let yourself not do everything perfectly and to mess up yeah. and be okay with it. And I found that sharing those messes, um, like if I have a bad interview or a bad pitch and I go to Instagram and I tell people about it, they're the ones who let me lift me back up and they're like, Hey, we're going to have bad days. Like what you're doing is important. We, we need you to keep going. You're on this path. Please keep going. Please keep building. Yeah. Now that's an example of one of the hardships, right? And I asked you what's been the most surprising positive thing, but what's been the most surprising hardship throughout the journey or challenge? I think I was unprepared for the amount of negative self-talk that I don't have what it takes. Mm -hmm. Why am I doing this? Like, why am I still trying to build this thing? Um, and that has recently kind of lessened. Um, an impactful book for me was a book called uh, Brave, Not Perfect, written by Reshma uh, Sajani, who is the CEO of Girls Who Code. And she really paints the picture of like how we are positioned as women in America, especially growing up to really be seen and not heard and to try to show up with our makeup on and our hair done. And all of those things are good things. But once we're in the room, once we're in those really hard rooms, we need that imposter syndrome or that self-talk to just st shut up and let yourself drive. Just go mm -hmm. forward and know what you're going to do. Um, but I think I was unprepared for how many times I was going to question, am I the person for the job? <laughs> Should I keep doing this? Yeah. I agree. <laughs> can you relate to that at all? I can totally relate. And especially the yeah. end part where you said, should I keep doing this? Like it, it, there is this, you know, point where I say it's like the top of the roller coaster where you're looking from in it and outside of it. And you're like, where am I at in this journey? Yeah. And yeah. I always tell my husband, I relate it to when people say like, there's going to be hustle seasons, you're going to work hard. There's going to be these moments that are going to be like the the tougher moments. And I always tell them, I'm like, it reminds me of when I was in the hospital for our first child, when we were delivering it and they'd say, what's your pain level? And this is like, probably really funny coming to yeah, you. Yeah. As like, what is, you probably <laughs> it is, I love it. Tell questions. me more. <laughs> and they would be like, what's your pain level on a scale of one to 10? And I'd be like, I mean, I don't know that I've ever experienced a 10. So I don't know that I yeah. can tell you that. And he yeah. would always laugh. He's like, Kelsey, you're probably the worst patient because you're like, because I'm girl. sitting there and I'm like, I mean, I'm fine. I'm in pain. It's probably right. a higher pain than I've had before. But if you cut my leg off, I'm pretty sure I'd be in a lot more pain. So I'm yeah. like, you know, I'd say on that level, I'm probably like a three. <laughs> and totally. he always used to laugh at me. And he's still to this day, he's like, you're the worst patient. And I'm like, well, how am I supposed to answer that question? Like, I'm sure I could be in a lot more pain if I actually think about it. And right, I relate right. this to entrepreneurship all the time because I'm like, I mean, I could work harder, right? You could always work harder. You could always yeah. put in more effort. You could always learn more or do more. But like, at what level? <laughs> at what mm -hmm. level are we talking about this? Right. And that has been really interesting for me on my journey to reflect and be like, so what is my gauge of like hard work right. and hustle? Because you, no one has an answer for you. Are you like me where in my head, I play this game of if I don't reach 40 hours this week, I'm not a real entrepreneur. I'm not really doing this. And I definitely it's, don't count my hours that way, but it's tasks where I'm like, yeah. okay, if I haven't done these things. Right. Sure. Yeah. It's like, and who the 40 hour work week we know is being debunked. Like it's not even a real thing anymore. Like, but in my head, I'm like, okay, if you didn't reach these hours, like you did not work hard enough. <laughs> yeah. No, I definitely, I don't, I feel like I've overcome the hours part of it. And I think part of that is because the nature of my business of like balancing motherhood and oh, yes. life. I need your app so badly. <laughs> is <laughs> So I think I've been able to kind of reprioritize in that. And so, um, you know, I, I share with our listeners a lot. I focus on having my three buckets a day, personally, professionally, and my people. And so if I, my professional bucket is like really full that week, I know that I need to focus more on like my people bucket or my personal bucket. 
Um, but that looks different. Right. And I can look at my professional bucket and be like, how did you not get that done? Like, how did you not get that task done? So I definitely resonate with you where I'm like, you know, to be a successful person, I don't even think it's just entrepreneurship. Right. Like I think that even stay at home moms probably look at this and they're like, how did you not get that laundry done? How did you not get those dishes done? And it's like, you can have a certain amount of time available and a task that needs to be done. And then you feel like a failure at the end of it. If you're like, I didn't push hard enough, or I didn't work right. hard enough to get that done. And it's like, that's not always how it comes. It's not just black and white. That's not how it's it really not. works, whether it's business tasks or household tasks or everything in between. So yeah. I think the moral of what we just talked about is no one's alone and we're all in it, right? <laughs> I'll try to figure it and out. It, these conversations are refreshing and having them with other founders or other people in your same group or community to just, you know, like I do need to hear out loud, like Katie, it's okay if you don't work 40 hours this week. You know, I it need is. to hear that I from somebody you. else. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I like, promise, tell me that. Okay, okay, Kelsey. No, it's so and true. I think, um, well, I think the 40 hour work week is a great example because it's like, why that number? Like, why right. is that number the number that needs to exist? And, and you know, there are probably weeks where I work well over 40 hours a week on my business and I did in my job. But then there's other weeks where it's like, okay, it's going to look different. And that's the beauty of entrepreneurship because sometimes it can't look different, especially in the field like you were in. You have to be physically present a certain number of hours a week. So you don't have the flexibility of being like, you know what? I'm just going to work harder next week on this. That's not how it works. You have little humans that are relying on you. And so I do think it is important for those that have have looked at a different journey or even, you know, if you are still in a field like that, where you have to be present is you have to control your other hours throughout the week and you have to reevaluate what is bringing you joy. And because at the end of the day, I mean, if you're spending 60 hours a week building this app, that's great. You're impacting a lot of people, but what, for what, you know, loss. At what, at what cost? Yeah. I, I so much resonate with that. And one of the other beauties of entrepreneurship is so much of my personal satisfaction I feel in my professional life. And Mm. I love when I can, like, I'm just fueled by, I can get into the zone, I can work on something and I feel like it was self-care, but it also helps my business. And I feel a lot of that way with audiobooks or podcasts um, because I know it serves me personally and it also serves me professionally. And that's so much of what I try to tell child life specialists. Like you want to stay in this field for the long haul. You want, you don't want to get burnt out after a couple of years of having to show yeah. up for those 12 hour shifts. So how can you invest in yourself personally that gives you that growth, but also helps you on your trajectory in your professional life? Yeah. And I think that exactly how you just said it is so important for parents too. And I have never worked in the healthcare field, but I have some of my closest friends do. And to your point, burnout is strong because you guys are navigating things that I can't even imagine. That's why I don't work in that field. And it it is so hard. You're giving yourself to others all day long and you're navigating Mm. such hard things that people are going through. Now, the aspect of really caring for yourself so you don't burn out and doing it at the early on so that you can be in that job forever is right. so important. And it reminds me of motherhood in the sense that we talk a lot about like the early seasons of motherhood, right? We talk about how the newborn stage is hard and the toddler stage is hard. And I think most of us know that every stage comes with its own challenges and own blessings when we're in motherhood. But what is so important is if you don't care for yourself at any point that you decide that you're going to take that leap, but if you can start at the beginning, then you're going to enjoy motherhood more. You're going to enjoy business and entrepreneurship more. You're going to enjoy your job and your healthcare, you know, career more, the earliest that you can start caring for yourself. So you don't burn out in anything that you're doing. Have you experienced burnout in this, in your journey yet? Would you say truly? I would say, um, not as a founder yet. I think I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm still very invigorated to build and keep learning, but as a child life specialist in the hospital through COVID, you know, I worked through, um, I left the hospital in October of 2021 and, um, you know, I don't know if people remember, I think so many of us have blocked it out, but kids weren't really getting sick during COVID. 
um, of course there were like the still, you know, diagnoses that were happening, but because we weren't spreading viral illnesses, children's hospitals relatively maintained pretty empty. So like, for example, um, we wouldn't have any kids on my unit. So I would go support the adult hospital. So I was supporting children of adult patients who were experiencing loss or had COVID or if their parents died. And, um, so my job really became supporting kids at the end, at the end of their parents' life. So having, helping them understand death and loss and what was happening in those goodbye visits that couldn't always happen in person and would have, have to happen over FaceTime. And I think, I don't know if it was burnout, but I got to the period where I thought, I don't, this isn't what fuels me anymore. And maybe earlier in my career, I could have been more equipped to handle it. But because I was where I was at in my career, because I was building Child Life on Call, because I had little kids, I couldn't leave work every day and go home and give myself to my family. And yeah. that's when I thought, okay, if I can turn this into my full-time gig, this is what I want to do. So I think I avoided burnout maybe just by an inch, um, wow. but definitely, you know, got a lot of help, had a therapist. I'm on antidepressants and anti-anxiety depression or medication. I talk about that all the time. I'm more than happy to chat with anybody about um, how to get that kind of help because it has helped me tremendously and has made me be more me than I've ever been. And it's so good to have that perspective, right? Because you hear from other people sometimes where they're like, oh, this made me not me. And so for right. you to say this made me more me is really important mm -hmm. to understand that it's not the same for everyone. So figure out, right. you know, what you do need and get that support. And gosh, yeah, that is such a challenging job. And again, thank you for doing these things to support other families and people. Before we it's dive into our lab. such a gift, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to say it's, I, I never want it to come out like I, it like broke me up because it didn't like, what a privilege to have the words to say to a dad who's losing his wife and has to tell his kids and everything is yeah. so scary, but I can tell him, here's how we can start the conversation. And here, you know, like I'm able to give some information to that that dad or whatever that circumstance may be. And that is like a privilege and an honor that I'll never take for granted to be within fam with families during those times. But it did come for me, I think just at the wrong time in my career and at the right time of starting to build something else. So I do, I do want to say that caveat because I feel so grateful to be able to have those skills. You're such a selfless person, Katie. And like oh, from gosh, what you've built into these conversations, no, you are. And I think when you are that person, you don't see it and you don't see how much you carry for others and what you put on yourself. So just thank you for that because it is, it is not an easy track and you could definitely take a different route and be like, you know what? I'm just going to go over here and hang out with my family and not worry about anybody <laughs> yeah. else or what I need to build. But yeah. when you have that calling, you're like, I don't know why I'm going to put myself through this crazy, but I'm going to because going I to. feel like I'm supposed to. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I totally understand. And just thank you for being one of those people. Um, before I ask my last couple final questions, where can everyone connect with you, the podcast, Instagram, and of course, download Child Life on Call? Yeah. So we're Child Life on Call on everything from our website to Instagram, which is probably where I'm the most active and um, probably give the most tips and relatable situations. So families, whether you're not in the hospital or you're out of the hospital or you're just a parent, um, that would be a great place to kind of go and get that. And then I would love, love, love uh, for you to download Child Life on Call. It's $19.99 for the entire year. Um, you'll get emails directly from me because so, I want to know how you're using it, how it's going, what you would change, what you like, what you don't like, what resonates with you. Um, and, you know, kind of just at the beginning of giving this to consumers, um, your insight is so incredibly um appreciated. So yes, that's, that's the best place to find me. Amazing. We'll link all that down below. Now you are three months into having this open to the general parents and, uh, like B to C like business to consumer community outside of the hospitals. What else is really lighting you up right now? What are you really excited about? And just like the, the goal that you currently have going on personally or professionally? 
Absolutely. So I think we built and are continuing to build and, and improve upon, which is our app of resources on demand. And I think what we're really trying to gear up for right now is actually virtual services with child life specialists. So say you have an upcoming life event like a blood draw or an EEG or a death in the family, and you really want to be able to talk to someone like a child life specialist, really ramping up those services is kind of where we're going to next. Very cool. And gives a new opportunity for those providers to have their job look a little differently, which is always really great and passionate about for moms because it gives us a different yes, version variety. of life. Yeah. Right. Leaving your Traditionally, little ones to when go, you had to, no, it's hard. Yeah. You got to go to the hospital. You got to do all those things. Yeah. If you could do, if it could look different, especially for certain seasons of life, that would be really, really great. Now, whether it's a mom founder or it's just mom that's just trying to make it through the day, what is one piece of advice that you would love to give for someone to take one action today? They could get off of this podcast and they could go move forward on something that would light them up, whether it's a business or personally, just to have a little bit of a better day. You know, we talked with a family advisory council when we were building the app and a family advisory council are usually um, groups of people at a big children's hospital and they help make decisions for the hospital to make sure it's as family friendly as possible. And one of the things that they helped us build into the app is our section called You Need Care Too. And every time you log into the app, that's the first banner that parents see, You Need Care Too. And that in order to care for your others, and even if your other is very sick, right, it's cancer, it's diabetes, it's asthma, they're, they're in an emergency, they fell and they have a brain bleed, you have to take care of you. Um, and so as a founder myself, I have to take care of me, both my physical, emotional, my health. And so I think the next step you can do in getting that clear mind to decide on what do you want to move forward on is giving yourself that space to have that clear head and care for yourself. So good. And what is your favorite way to care for yourself? You mentioned exercise, but I'll, I'll get one more from you. Yeah. 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 And of course that comes with a double-edged sword. I would yeah. say, um, I love being with my family. We're in Austin and we have an abundance of breweries. And I know that probably sounds weird, but all of them have playgrounds. And yeah. there are a few days in Austin where like the sun shines and it's the perfect weather and you're at a brewery with your dog and your kids. And you're just like, this is what fills me up. So I think that together time with putting the phone down, being with my family and just being outside with a beer or a glass of wine is like, that's the best for me. Yeah. The simple things that we sometimes forget about. So yes. I love that. Katie, thank you again so much, like I said, for building this, for pouring yourself into others and for being with us here today. You've just given us so much you know, insight and a great resource to be able to support mm -hmm. anyone in those moments that we don't want to think about, but they come. So having the right resources and support when things are extra hard is really, really great. So thank you. Thank you, Kelsey, for having me and for all you do to lift other people up. Um, I, it makes me gravitate towards you and um, others, I'm sure. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Katie.